that God separates you for his glory. But thank God that with all that I've endured and when I find a lovely family like this, uh, I'm just so honored um, to be in fellowship with them and to, to serve them, whatever God has given me, access to finances, access to resources. My whole career has been in mining. When Zimbabwe found out it had the world's largest deposit of minerals in 2008 and 9, the president and the team flew me in. I was the only European that was given a license to trade in diamonds. I have the complete geological report of the entire country. I dealt with the lawyers, I dealt with all the, I, in fact, we invested in some of the mines that were coming up. So I know when the man of God was talking about the role of minerals in the kingdom, God pushed my career in that direction. I've been in technology all of my life. For the last 30 years, I was advising the boards of some of the largest technology companies in the world. By God's strength, I don't say that to boast. So again, what God has given us for Shinestone for the kingdom is a fusion of my 30 years working in technology and understanding technology, understanding minerals and understanding financial structures and systems to affect change to finance the kingdom of God. I said all that to say, so when the man of God was speaking about stones and he was talking about different things, I just want you to let you know God is speaking to you and everything you're hearing is from the throne room. Are you hearing me? God is speaking through his servants. And as he speaks to you and it resonates, accept it and digest it. Before I go any further, please put your hands together for these two wonderful, beautiful, incredible conduits for the last and finest move of God in the earth. We appreciate you for your role here. You can be seated to all the men of God that have gone before to Apostle Jacobs and his beloved wife, uh, and to all of you, thank you so much again for bearing with me. I'm sure my diction and the detail um, isn't the norm, and uh, I just want to appreciate you and thank you and say well done for flowing with me and, uh, and, and, and gaining or taking some nuggets of truth. How many have been changed forever as a result of a breakthrough and a breaking down of religiosity that kept you blindfolded. How many people feel free now to fly? Touch your neighbor and say, I feel like I can fly. I feel like I can touch the sky. <laughs> when I wake up every now and I say, I've woken up, not waking up. Come on, <laughs> spread my wings and fly away. Come on. Stand to your feet and spread those wings because there's a wind. There's a wind of truth that is coming. And when an eagle lets his wings out, he doesn't have to flap. He just soars under the thermos of the heat of the wind. The wind of the Holy Ghost, the Ruach, is about to breathe. Stretch your mandiosa. Stretch your hands out and let God's breath take you to heights you never thought were attainable. And where God's about to take you, no enemy can get there. They have a story or an analogy or a, a truism that says when an eagle meets a snake, it doesn't fight the snake on its level. It grabs the snake and takes it up to its level. And the unfamiliar height and territory that is familiar to the eagle completely brings discombobulation and a level of confusion to the snake and renders him impotent. For you, you need to soar high and every snake that has been trying to get you, don't run from it. Take it to the heights where God is taking you with the wisdom, the knowledge and the understanding, the insight and the truth and he will not know what to do with himself. Get all of the snakes on your mind, snakes in churches, snakes in institutions, snakes in the corporate environment, snakes even in your own family. Get them on your mind right now and supernaturally imagine taking them up to the heights because you're moving to new levels today. Take them up to new heights and nullify their words. Give God praise that the enemy is intimidated today. Something awesome is happening in here today. You're about to be transferred forever.
transformed forever, elevated to a new level. Give God praise one final time. You can be seated. Not one final time. You can be seated. I'm going to say exactly what God said say. Please forgive my geeky glasses. But I need to be able to see. <laughs> These are handmade glasses from L.A. that only billionaires wear. Did you hear what I said? <laughs> I'm not trying to boast because I'm nothing. I'm nobody. Everything I have belongs to God. Anything I ever have will belong to God's people. So I, I'm not trying to elevate myself. I have no delusions of grandeur. But you just got to know who you are. In fact, I say this humbly because I'm only a servant to the kingdom. My very first conference here at the Good Hope Center um, in Cape Town, when I finished my session, another man called me out and said, God told me to tell you, he was a bishop from Alabama, he said, stop believing God for millions. At the time I was a millionaire, I went through bankruptcy later, lost absolutely everything on every level. But at the time I was a millionaire, he said, stop, God says, stop believing for millions. He didn't know I was a millionaire. He said, God says, you are his billionaire. For the reformation of the kingdom of God. Didn't really understand it fully to the extent. And when we brought Bishop Jakes to the UK for his first conference in 2005, I was behind the scenes, wrote the contract. I was helping the actual promoter of the event. And again, a man came up to me from the ministry up the end, he said, God gave me a vision about you that I would know you by your tailored suits. And he said, the stitching on your suits, this is not one of them, but I said, the stitching on your suits will reveal who you are. And God said in the dream, when I looked into your eyes, God says, you are a Bill Gates for the kingdom of God. <laughs> Remember, uh, well, when God says something and uses an analogy that's in the world, you are the antithesis in many ways. So what the devil does for evil, God will do for good. So we, and I'm representative of a body of people, it's not just me, obviously, I'm a type like many of you here, but what God will bless us with will bless the nations. Hello? We'll lift and alleviate poverty forever. Are you hearing me? We'll come up with uh, new... Uh, innovations even in medicines to counter the stuff of eugenics that they've been I don't even want to go there stuff that has been harming you God is going to reverse that oh you don't know they're trying hard to dumb you down trying hard to inset and in, in, release diseases in the atmosphere there's chemtrails in the skies there's all sorts of stuff that they throw you away but how many people know no weapon formed against you will be able to prosper and God is going to reverse stuff and give kingdom people insight into discoveries that will absolutely reverse everything the enemy is trying to do. So we're living in a fine outlook. But I said all that to say that this man also said to me, God wants you to focus on Africa. And I said, God, Africa? I'm black. I have hue and melanin, as you can see, in my skin, but I'm culturally very British. Or I was born there. So Africa, I thought Africa, as a technologist working with big technology companies flying around the world doing stuff, um, I thought Africa. But I was obedient. I said, I'll follow you, God. And when the door started to open a couple of years later, when Zimbabwe found it had the world's largest positive diamonds, I was invited in. And from there, I've never looked back. Africa is where it's at. Are you hearing me? This is going to be the continent that will surpass all other continents in terms of economic growth, innovation, development. Africa has all the water, electricity, and money to finance the entire continent plus the rest of the continents put together. What they need is the right leadership, they need the right uh, strategies, they need the right understanding, and they need the power of Jesus Christ to unlock everything that the enemy has locked up. 
the spirits of mammon and the other spirits that have tied up the finances made the continent impoverished God is reversing that by the power of Jesus Christ and I came to declare some stuff to this region God said you must step out in apostolic authority this morning and declare some stuff in the region with power and with confidence I came to declare to the kingdoms of this world that our God is Jesus the King Oh, you need to understand, Revelations 11, 15 says, the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. A kingdom is a king domain of influence. It could be an industry sector. It could be a business vertical sector. Any place, health, whatever, mining, education, they're all domains of kings. God said every single domain in this sphere called earth is now coming up under his auspices and leadership. And guess what? He needs some kings to represent the king of kings over those kingdoms. So you wonder why. See, the one of the scriptures I love is the Bible says, delight your ways, which is a derivative of light. It means Eden, which means delight. But when you delight your ways, God will give you your Eden. It means when you delight your ways in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. We get excited about that because we think when we ask God for desires, he's going to give us whatever we want. That's not what the scripture means. It means that I will place in your heart the desires I want you to have. When your ways delight him, I will give you those desires. I will invest them in your heart. And those passions become then your navigating sat-nav that drives your passions to do whatever it is you do. I said that to say, so if you've got a passion for health, God gave you that desire. If you have a passion for commerce, God gave you that desire. If you have a passion to help women with mental health, God gave you that desire. If you have a passion to alleviate the pole, then God gave you that desire. Are you hearing me today? So I need some people not to get bent out of shape when your desire doesn't marry up with somebody else's desire. You need to be true to the passion God gave you because that is your map to find your treasure, but also also is the navigation that is going to give you direction. Come on now, let me help you. Your problems, oh God, thank you, and your, uh, uh, your problems um, and your passions are a clue to your purpose. I just gave you a formulaic little key from the kingdom. See, God uses your most recurring problems to educate you on the subject matter. See, if you don't go through it, how can you help anyone out of it? So you think I struggle with drugs, I struggle with pornography. I'm not talking about me, but I'm talking universally. Or I struggled with whatever. God allows you to go through that to qualify you for insight and information and wisdom. Your problems are and your passions are a clue to your purpose. If you want to know what you're called to do, check the problems that are most recurring in your life. You are a solution to that problem. Are you hearing me? Your light, your information, your revelation, and experiential knowledge will help you understand how to address that demon. Then your passions might be for people in terms of a particular agenda of women. It might be to fix problems. When you see disorder, you, you get out of order. You know, you, you know some people, when you go into an environment, if things are not running efficaciously, it kind of just annoys you because you have a spirit of excellence upon you. That means you might be a pro- program manager, you might be a project manager, you might be a, an, a, an analyst, you might be a, 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 any kind, you might be a designer, but God is placing you the, the ability to see how things should run in order. That's your passion. Wherever you go, you're OCD. You have to tidy everything up. Am I talking to some people here? You can't hang around everybody's house because when you show up and it's a mess, there's something in you says, oh, can we just tidy that up? Uh, Can we put that there? I don't even live there, but I think you could do that with that over there. I think you could actually, mm, that color doesn't quite work with those cushions. I think you could actually fix that over there. You have a passion for order. So your problems qualify you for insight and information. 
your passions give you direction in terms of the area and those two keys equal your godly kingdom purpose are you with me stand to your feet and say I now understand my purpose and may I ask some people when people are going through stuff don't be quick to pull them out of it oh it takes wise leadership wise leadership because we've got such big hearts and love people we don't want them to suffer we actually feel it, 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 we feel the pain we, we cry with those who cry we weep with those who weep we want to help them out of the suffering but you could be limiting their education by pulling them out of the situation so sometimes you have to not sometimes you should discern and understand what is God doing with that person because maybe he needs them to sit there for five years, fermenting, frustrated, and doing what to learn what he wants them to learn. God doesn't do anything by accident. Maybe you grew up in that particular family. And sorry to be honest, there could be all kinds of uh, strange things happening in that family. But it's because God wanted to give you the insight of what abuse looks like. He needed to give you the understanding of what molestation looks like. What abuse looks like in terms of domestic abuse and violence. He needed to teach you these skills and understanding and empathy that when he pulls you out of it and then give, qualifies you with information and gives you revelation and gives you light and power, you can go back and start fixing stuff you could never touch if you didn't have an understanding. Are you hearing me? So stop getting bent out of shape. God is covering you. He's protecting you. He is going to turn what the devil meant for evil around for your good. You do not need to worry. Now lift your hands to heaven very quickly and say, thank you God for all things. For this is the will of God. Thank you for my suffering. Because the suffering of this present time isn't worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. The Bible says he doesn't tempt you above that which you're able. With every temptation, he makes a way of escape that you can bear it. Tell your neighbor, you can handle it. You can handle the criticism. You can handle the backlash. You can handle the vilification. You can handle it. In fact, you're anointed to take it. Tell him, bring it on. It's only building me up. Come on, you need to fight back and believe God. The devil's in trouble. Tell him, bring it on. It's just building me. I can handle it. And stop trying to find a way of escape. That's his job. Sit there and allow God to do his thing. So lift your hands up one more time. Say, God, thank you for the strength to endure. I'll endure hardship as a good soldier. As a brave soldier. I'll handle it. Though you slay me, yet will I trust you. I'll trust in the Lord at all times. Lean not on my own cognitive processes and understanding. In all my ways, acknowledge him. Why? Because destiny is directing my path. He knows the path that I take, but when he has tried us, we shall come forward as pure gold. I need some people who have already been excavated out of the dirt and being polished up in a smelting machine because God is turning you into rich dory bars a whole mark of the kingdom is about to be stamped onto you today I want you to give God praise that your value has just shot through the roof and your rare commodity of what God has given you is now going to be sought after are you hearing me give God praise you can be seated Are you going to pray for me? I've got some tough stuff to say, but it's all good. Are you here? Sorry. Thank you. God said I should declare that he is Lord over every territory, over every realm, over every domain. Are you here? Tell me to Daniel. Chapter 2, Father, thank you for the awesome privilege of just being a mouthpiece an echo, a reverberation of the frequencies of heaven. Father, as truth prevails and permeates this environment, let it go into the deep crevices of the mind and the hearts of your people. 
Father, let it lift out everything that's not like you. Father, let it be replaced with absolute truth that undergirds them with strength like never before. And Father, you said, they that know the Lord shall be strong and do great exports. We thank you for this privilege in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen. amen. Daniel chapter 2, God said, just to drop this down quickly, and I'm going to get into some of the detail. Daniel chapter 2. Has everyone seen the Shine Stone video? Has everyone seen it? Please get a copy on your own personal tablet or your own personal phone, laptop, or go to the website and keep on playing those videos that it will get into your system, get into your being what God has ordained. Are you hearing me? This is the future, that is the blueprint, that is what God is blessing, that's what you are all a part of, this is what you will live in and enjoy, and generations to come will be blessed by it. Start seeking God about business, but let me put a caveat there Caveat is a condition to consider before running off with creative ideas. Pray that your business is not just an idea that came from you, but an idea that came from heaven. Please understand, this is not the season of the entrepreneur in the context of just create a business and ask God to bless it. No. This is the season where the business itself is a ministry for God to bless and finance and resource to be a blessing. So just as you wouldn't run and ordain yourself and start running a church, you can't just run and ordain yourself and start running a business. You have to pray and seek God for the subject matter that he's called you to address. What gives business value is the solution that it solves. Not your creative idea. What problem are you solving by the service provision of your business? And what experience are people having when they engage with your brand and with you that enhances their life? People pay for when you alleviate problems. So your business, think about it. Remember, your problems and your passions are a clue to your purpose. Let me help you, if you're gonna think of a business, think of something that you're already passionate about and an area where you've had problems. Somewhere where you care as a subject matter will help you develop the insight to be able to deliver a service well. That's what people will pay for. By the way, as you plug into Shinestone, and plug into what God, man of God's doing here, we're gonna fund those activities. Oh, two of you are happy? You go try and do it by yourself. <laughs> I said that humbly because God is financing his kingdom initiatives. Are you hearing me? It's a sweatless era. God is gonna provide the provisions you need to do what he's called you to do. A king is known by the environment that reflects where he comes from. Is he coming back for a glorious church without spot and wrinkle? Yes? Glory means docs and cabal, affluence and influence. So God is going to feed to it before he returns that you and your business starts to do things that reflects where he's come from. Oh, that was understand. Okay, before a king returns, he sends people ahead of him to set the environment so it looks like where the king comes from. Oh, you don't understand. So we as vice regents, as agents, as kings in the earth, our job is not just to bask in our own importance, our self-indulgence that our name means something. This is a season and I'm going to deal with it in what's new in 22. We must decrease, get out the way. So he can increase. It's his glory or no story. Sorry to be honest with you. So we need to get out the way so his glory can come. Are you hearing me? So it's vitally important that we recognize that what we build is not about us. Our job as a vice regent, our job as an ambassador for the kingdom, our job as a strategist, as a financier, whatever we do is to advance his will in the earth. And when he sees 
the environment starting to come like where he's from. He wanna, he'll want to or have a greater propensity to come back. Oh. I don't know if you heard that. That's a bit radical for some of you. But have you ever considered maybe the reason God hasn't come back yet is that the people of God aren't reflecting where he came from? Oh, you need to understand. God is a God of order. He's not just going to come and sit in any mess. That'd be like inviting President Cyril Ramaphosa or the Queen, God bless her soul, to your house and your house is in a complete mess. Feces on the wall, sorry to be so graphic. Mess everywhere. Urinated carpets. No order. Everything messed up. Would you expect royalty to come and say, oh, come on, dwell at my place for a few days. Hang out with me. Let's work together. It's not going to happen, is it? Your king is the same. He wants to dwell with you, but he's given you the power to fix the environment that it looks like where he's come from. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Are you hearing me? I need some people who are going to start fixing up their lives, fixing up the environment, going to be uncompromisingly, un, not, well, unadulteratedly bold about what God's called you to do and what he's called you to fix. It means shining your light so brightly that if other people have a problem with it, let it dazzle them. Never turn down your light because other people have a problem with how bright you shine. The devil is a liar. Don't even pray for them, and I don't mean that horribly. Let the light penetrate them. Maybe they need it to get into their soul. But be as bright as you can. Shine as bright as you can. Because God needs you to do so. Those who are going to do that, jump to your feet one more time and say, God, I'm going to shine bright. I'm going to open up my mouth and speak light. I'm going to shine in and dissipate darkness. I'm going to set order where you want me to. I'm going to bring the kingdom of God into my workplace, into my family, into all the spheres of influence, and I will advance the business activities that advance your will in the earth. Bless his name. Give your God praise one more time. So you can be seated. So let's just deal with a couple of scriptures. So I've got to share something, and I'm really going to get a bit deep. So fasten your seatbelts. So... We've read Revelation 15, 11. It says, The kingdoms of this world shall become the kings of the Lord and his Christ. I want to go to Daniel chapter 7, verse 27. And hear what God is saying about the time now. Are you all here? You don't need me to shout and scream. And You've had the best preaching you could ever hear from the man of God who just spoke. You don't need more of that. I'm going to put line upon line, precept upon precept, and give you some information and revelation that will enhance and finesse and develop what you've already received in terms of the preaching. Is that okay? Daniel 7.27 says, And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Did you hear what the Bible just said? Some kingdom people should have got happy about that. It didn't say you have to work for it. It said it shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. Who are the saints of the Most High? Do I have any acknowledgement in here? Is there, are there any saints of the Most High in here? High in terms of lofty place, high in terms of elevation, but also high in terms of frequency and light. Do I have any people who's resonating on a level that's calling God's presence into this environment? into the earth to manifest as the true king of kings and the lords of lords. Do I have anyone here who's resonating that line? Look your faith, neighbor in the face and say, start to shine bright. Because the kingdom shall be given to the saints of the most high and all domains shall serve and obey him through you. 
Daniel 7:27. Astrologically, Daniel is far more accurate than Revelation. Revelation is really apocalypsis, which means a period of light, a season of light. Apocalypsis also means coming and appearing. In Revelation, we've made it all about the second coming and the appearing of God. But can I tell you, Revelation chapter 1, if you look at it, first verse says, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. <laughs> I didn't even flow with me. The book of Revelation is an apocalypse of all future tell it told events. The Bible says it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. Oh, I don't know if you understand. Who was, is, and is to come. He is the Alpha, Aleph, Tav, and Omega, the beginning and the ending. So Revelation, please don't see it as a foretelling of prophetic events. See it as a revelation of light of who Jesus Christ truly is. And that everything from the beginning that was and that is and is to come, comes through Jesus Christ. The true light, apocalypsis. I don't know if you understand me. Who will appear? Who is coming? Can I drop something in your mind just for a minute? Have you ever thought that the second coming might be similar to how he moved on the earth in the first place? Before he physically moves, maybe his light will move. Oh. You're looking for God to show up, break the clouds, come with all of his regalia on his horse to rescue you and take you to the sweet by and by. But have you ever thought from a revelation point of view that his first second coming might be a greater deluge of his light? Revelation is apocalypsis, which means a season of light. Also means Eden. It also means when you remove certain things, you see things more clearly. Beloved, John 3 tells you, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know when he shall appear light, we shall be like him light, and we shall see him as he is light. When God brings order, he first sends his spirit, which is light. I don't know if you understand. Genesis 1 he came in the form of light first before light was. You think the first time light showed up is, sorry, I don't mean that non-didactically. I'm, I'm not trying to be condescending. Some of you might believe light came when he said, let there be light. That's not when light came. Light came when he showed up. The spirit of God, which is light, moved on the face of the deep. And then there was light. How do we know? It wasn't until later that he created the elements that created light. So in Genesis 1, there was the one, it was already light. Before the sun was put there, before the lesser light was put there, there was already light everywhere. Oh, you don't understand. I thought you knew your Bible in this place. So God's presence was ubiquitously covered the earth and everything that was void, dark, whatever had to dissipate so maybe when God comes back just as a theory his return might be greater light greater insight greater vision greater illumination dissipation of darkness are oh, you receiving this are you hearing me let me give you a little bit more in Genesis chapter 1 just a bit more revelation for you that will help you do you know you were first created Equal man and woman, by the way. Can I help you? God in Genesis 1, 26, 27 said that he created man in his image and his likeness. He created male and female, created he them. Can I tell you something? You were created in Genesis 1, not in Genesis 2. 
You were first created as light beings, as spirit beings, male and female in Genesis 1. Scripture. When God says a thing, it's done. He said it in Genesis 1. It wasn't until Genesis 2 that he formed man from the dust of the earth. And blew in him and man became a living soul. But he had a pre-existence before he was formed. Oh, please understand. He was a spirit being in Genesis chapter 1 with Eve by his side, created he then male and female. Oh, you don't understand. Stop diminishing the role of your woman. She has the exact same spirit, exact same authority, exact same DNA, and exactly the same assignment. How can I tell you? When, well, know that when God said to man, Genesis 1:28, take dominion, subdue, multiply, replenish the earth. He was speaking to both of them at the same time. She was just in spirit form like he was. And then God took the spirit and blew them both into the body he formed and then removed Eve out of his side so she would have the same physical DNA that Adam had. Oh, check your Bible. He was, they were created in Genesis 1, but they were formed in Genesis 2. Know the order of God. You were a light being, you were a spiritual being, you had everything programmed in you as a spiritual person, full omnipotence, full omnipresence, full omniscience, and full omnibenevolence. You had everything in you before God put you in a physical body. And then he blew into the nostrils of Adam. Eve went through the nostrils into Adam as a spirit. And then God took her out with a bone, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. Eve, women and men have the exact same assignment. The man obviously protects, provides and pastors on behalf of God, but actually in terms of kingdom assignment, they're very similar. Did you hear me? Did you get that revelation? Go study your Bible, it's in there. You'll understand, but let me get back to the point. So how many people are getting ready to receive a kingdom? So I said that to say, women, please don't wait for your man. I'm not creating disorder. I'm letting you know that you have equal right to advance God's kingdom in the earth. Esther, Deborah, Sarah, you are just as much a queen with kings inside of you and nations of kings inside of you, just like Abraham. Are you hearing me, Sarah? I need the women to stand up who's waiting for a man before you, waiting for marriage, yoking together with your king and your Boaz and Boo, before you advance what God's called you to do. That devil is a liar. You've already been given everything you need to be an awesome woman of God to advance God's kingdom in the earth. Business ideas will come to you. Strategies will infiltrate your mind. Creative ideas. There's nothing like a woman to just state ideas and birth it. Are you hearing me? In fact, more women need to rise up so they can receive the seed of God's kingdom ideas. Just state them, nurture them, and birth them. Are you with me? I just, some, of, some of the women just stand up for a second. There is going to be a new anointing of confidence that gives you a level of independence. I'm not pushing a lack of unity because two are better than one. Always in God's order, two. But I want you to lift your hands up and say, God, use me. Even if I'm on my own, bless me to be a blessing. In Jesus' name, you can be seated. Clap your hands for the liberation that's coming. I just want to declare one final thing um, before I get into the revelation God told me to reveal, which is that where we are now is Daniel 2. Are you hearing me? I believe it's Daniel 2, 44, yes. This is where we are now. Get ready, kingdoms are about to tumble. 
<laughs> you don't understand. The reason shine stone called shine stone is that one of the things about the stone is that it was shooed out of the mountain without hands. Oh, you don't understand. We're now in a season where God's going to do things by himself. And no man's going to say that he did it on behalf of God. I don't mean this disrespectfully, but a lot of people have been hindered, not in this house, by the insecurities of people above you. I know this for a fact. Did you hear what I just said? Some of you, out of your servitude, attitude, and heart to serve, which is the right thing to do. This is not the case in this house. I know this for a fact. But in some houses, your future has been uh, clipped to some degree or hindered or thwarted because you're under a person who's not secure. And a bit like Sarah's father, Tira, who was a worshipper of other gods, he wanted Sarah to make him look great. That's why he named her what he named her. And I'll come on to that in a second. So you have to understand, listen deeply to what I'm saying. Some people want you to only make them look great. And want to take the credit for everything that you have done. Am I talking truth to anyone? I know it's hard truth, but trust me, I can say what needs to be said. I'm not looking to be popular, I talk truth. And many people in the body of Christ have completely been, stunt, been stunted because they're in the wrong ministry. They're under a leader who's insecure. I release everyone online who will see the fruit of someone who's insecure. They can't give recognition where recognition is due. They can't delegate where they should be delegating. They have to be involved in everything. And sometimes, yes, that's because of the level of excellence they have, but most of the time is that they feel uncomfortable if somebody outshines them. I'm breaking the back of that spirit in the body of Christ that the stones that have been formed by God hewed out of the mountain that God is getting ready to smash down every other kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar's statue. Come on, get ready. God's about to use you to break down. Didn't the man God say cancel certain eras, cancel certain governments, cancel certain kingdoms? They're all about to come down. The stone, which is you touching every say, I'm one of those stones. In fact, the stone that was rejected by the builders, the builders were the Freemasons at the time. The builders that reject the stone is now that stone is becoming the chief cornerstone, the principal stone in the building of God's kingdom in the earth. Some of you have been held down and rejected and God's saying you're going to go from a place of obscurity and rejection to a place of notoriety and elevation. I need some people who've been held down or I need some people who no, I'm just being obedient, waiting on my time. But this man before me doesn't like to let me go. The devil is a liar. God is breaking and moving everything that has been holding you back because the light of God needs you to be on a hill. He needs you to come out from under the bushel. And some ministries are exactly that. They can't, I'm not creating disorder. Please hear me. I'm talking truth. And so if you sit under an insecure leader, if your light has been eclipsed a little bit because of who you sit under, you need to move. Come out from among them and be ye separate. I'm speaking hard truth, but I'm telling you as God told me to tell you. Because what God's doing in the kingdom now, no man is going to get the credit. God hewed out the stone out of the mountain without human hands. This is what's happening now. Are you hearing me? And he threw it at the, the image of Nebuchadnezzar. And it says, in the days of these kings, say, I'm one of those kings, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. Who's setting it up? God is setting it up. Which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall be not left to another people, say it's exclusively ours. Are you still here? Yeah. It goes on to say, and the kingdom, one second, I say, God, so the kingdom shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to another people. 
but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest the stone was cut out of the mountains without hands and that break it, break it in pieces, the iron, the brass, the clay and the silver and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter and the dream is certain and the interpretation thereof. Are you with me? Are you hearing me? God is about to take a stone. Shine stone is one of those stones. He's going to aim it at the feet of Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian, Media Persians, Grecians, Roman Empire. And where we are today is the feet of clay and iron. That stone is about to bring down all other kingdoms that they are going to become like chaff in the wind. Do I know some people in the house, I think I do, who believe there's a reason why you are who you are. You cannot compromise who you are. You have to be who God's told you to be because you have a role in destroying the kingdoms of this world. Is anyone here with me? And as the man of God says, I'll echo it. Be careful who you share your vision with. Even though, to some degree, God is an orchestrator of all things, because all things work together for good. But not all kinfolk, sorry, all skinfolk are kinfolk. And I, I, I'm going to break one other anathema over Africa and over people of our color. We, by nature, do not support each other as we should. Can I deal with that spirit for a second? God told me to declare some things in the heavenlies and break the back of individualism. Are you hearing me? Of motives that will have a crab mentality in a bucket. Meaning that you'd rather pull somebody down than see them break out. So that particular spirit that is invested in the DNA of black folk. It's a slavery mentality that every man for himself. I curse that in the name of Jesus. I bring a level of collaboration. I bring a level of unity. I bring a level of compassion. Your success is my success. A whole lot more would get done if we didn't care who got the credit. Did you hear what I said? I need God's people to mature and to break, wake up and to be people that if I don't get the credit, it doesn't matter. As long as it happens, as long as it comes to pass, as long as the generations after me can live like I didn't even get to live, as long as together we can wreck the devil's kingdom, that is what matters. Lay your hands on your neighbor's head. Don't worry about who gets the credit. Help who you need to help. Collaborate with who you need to collaborate with. Do what you need to do. The devil is so intimidated by black people that he is so in this mindset, I'd rather kill you than support you. I'd rather curse you than bless you. And when God starts blessing you, it makes me feel bad. The devil is a liar. We need to learn to celebrate we don't do enough of that. We need to celebrate black people with all due respect. I don't mind what hue or melanin, whether you're colored black or white, it doesn't really matter. We're all the same people. African people need to learn to celebrate African people. I don't care what the tribe is, celebrate them. Please, I'm asking you deeply to pray and ask God to develop a mindset that jealousy never shows its face. Envy has no place in kingdom people. And that you will do your endeavored best to support your brother, celebrate your brother. And one of the other challenges in church is that when other churches start to grow, other churches get intimidated. Coming up with all kinds of slander and or whatever they can do to bring them down. That this is not going to happen in the kingdom. When God starts to finance businesses, you're going to get around them and celebrate them. Hello? I don't know if you're hearing me. I'm setting some order in the house, but let me crack on because of time. Are you hearing me? So God said, I need to declare these things, that the kings of the earth shall become the kings of the Lord his Christ, that the stone that the builders rejected shall become the chief cornerstone, and that the stone hewed out of the mountain that smashes down every other kingdom is about to cause all the kingdoms of this world to fall and crumble. 
Touch your neighbor and say, I'm a nation shaker. Are you here? So let me get into what I want to deal with. By now, you must have been challenged by some of these transformative kingdom revelations. How many people have been challenged and transformed by these kingdom revelations? And I hope that they become catalysts for kingdom revolutions, not just evolution. And I pray by God's grace that kingdom breaks out everywhere. I mean the authentic, true Basilea, true theocratic kingdom of God. And it has to be about him. Remember this. It's not about your name. It's about his name. Are you hearing me? So I want to say that God's asked me just to share a few things with you. Um, which might be a little bit controversial, but it is something that you need to know in the kingdom. Turn with me to Daniel 11, verse 32. Daniel 11, 32. Are you here? Daniel 11, 32. Daniel 11, 32. The Bible says, As such as do wickedly against the covenant, shall he corrupt by flatteries but the people of what does it say but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits are you still here it says as such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits first point Please do not be moved by the flattery of men. One of the qualifications for the kingdom of God is that you are bereft or devoid or not needing the recognition, the plaudits and the accolade of men. You do realize that church has set a stage that we celebrate gifts and by default can develop an environment where we're pampering to the egos of men. Did you hear what I said? What I mean by that is in, but we, we, we really put pressure on people to perform so they can get the praise and they can get the, the plaudits and the claps of the people in the congregation. The riffs of when they're singing and how elaborate and colorful their runs are when they're singing. Sometimes it's motivated by the need for the flatteries of men. Man, you sung today. Preachers are put under inordinate pressure, not to speak truth, but to whip you into a frenzy. Change keys, preach hoop and hack, and cracker jack, as I call it. Frothing at the mouth, so you can say, man, they preach today. Pastor preached today. Did you learn anything? No, but pastor preached today. The Holy Ghost moved. What did he say? I don't know, but pastor preached today. I feel happy. All that was was frequency that stimulated you on a cellular level. But it didn't do anything on a spiritual level. And that's because we've created churches that are more driven by getting accolade and appreciation and recognition and the claps of the audience than delivering truth. The Bible is saying if you're going to know your God and be strong and do exploits, you cannot be motivated by the praise of the people. But it's my makeup. I'm an expressive and I'm a extrovert. And when people praise me, it gives me energy. God says you will be corrupt easily by the flatteries of men. Are you hearing me? Touch your neighbor and say, ouch, but it's right. I release you from the need of praise from people. People's opinion we give way too much weight to. And we'll push ourselves to do stuff just so people can praise us more than the truth that they need to hear. Are you hearing me? This is good teaching for you. You need to hear this. Because this is going to thwart the move of the kingdom if we're driven by what people say about us. How much they praise us. How much they respect and rate us. Are you hearing me today? But it goes on to say that they that everyone say no, their God shall be strong and do exploits. 
The word strong is the Hebrew word hitha, which means to have courage. They that know their Lord will have courage like never before. Why? Because we have to face some Goliaths. We have to pull some kingdoms down. We have to lead in ways that's never been done before. We need to be courageous because there is no path that has been set before us. This is uncharted territory. You have an apostolic call because apostles go where no man has gone before. They cut paths and they make ways and they call everyone to come where you have cut your trail blazer. If you don't have courage and if you have a fear of failing, how's God going to use you to do something that's never been done before? You are the first of your kind and there is no frame of reference for what God is going to do with you. Why? Because you are the first fruits of your family. You are the first fruits. That's when Jesus came up before heaven. They said uh, in, in Psalms, I think one of the scriptures there said, who is the king of glory? The angel was saying, we don't know who this is. Uh, we haven't seen flesh in heaven before. Who is the king of glory? And they had to announce the Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Who is this king of glory? It's a question they didn't know. They haven't seen flesh in heaven before. I don't know if you understand. So unless you know God and you have strength and you're strong you'll never be able to do the new things he's called you to do by the way God is doing a new thing which means it's well to some degree scripture says no, there's nothing new under the heaven so it's but it's a revealed thing that others haven't seen before it's not a new thing to God it's, it's the same old thing that he's done before but actually it's a revelation to those who are around at this time they've never seen you do what you're about to do now especially people who Know where you came from. That's why Jesus never had any honor amongst his own people. They knew his history. They knew where he was coming from. If you don't know the Lord and are not strong, you cannot do exploits. Are you hearing me? How many people have a fear of failing? Be honest. Okay, those who don't care about what other people think, put your hand up. <laughs> the first question you would have answered more honestly if you didn't care about what people thought about you ask again how many people have a fear of failing okay how many people like to tell the truth in church I know I don't have my glasses on but I can see hands one of the biggest things the enemy's put in us is the fear of failing the fear of messing up the fear of getting it wrong we don't want our friends like Job to come around us and say nothing for seven days when they see the level of our failure. We can't handle it. Come on, be honest, church of God. How many of you really care about what people think to the degree that if you do fail, you struggle? You don't want to bring a reproach on your family or on the name of the family. You don't want to mess up and do things. But unless you've got courage, you won't step out. By the way, in God, there's no such thing as failure. You're only falling forward. Are you hearing, I don't know if you're hearing me today. There's no such thing as failure. Let me scrub that from your mentality. If you make a mistake, it's a learning process. If, I, if I've messed up here, oh gosh, I won't do that again. Oh, I'm further than where I was before. And now I know how I can put this foot here and I can do this. And before you know it, the mistakes that you think are mistakes were learnings to take you where you never would have gone before. Stop being afraid of trying because failure is God's way of teaching you so you fail forward. Every mistake, I promise you, God will turn it around for your good. What you think is a mistake is a learning experience. So don't let the devil say, no, you can't do that. Who do you think you are? Where do where you come from? Don't you know your cousin Tun Tun? Don't you know what your family name stands for? Don't you know what people think about you, where you come from? Who's ever, has anything good come out of Nazareth? Has, any, has anyone ever come out of this family who have made money? You've all been poor. You've all been to prison. Don't let what people think about you tell you what is possible for you. I need to reiterate that to some people. Where you've come from, what your other family members haven't been able to do, there's no relationship to what God is about to do with you. So you need to know your God and be strong. Tell your neighbor, be strong.
last thing it means, strength or being strong means to withstand. So the Bible talks about having done all to stand, to still stand. Having your loins get about with truth. Be true to what God's called you to do, even if it's an unpopular thing to do. Did you hear what I just said? I know this is not preaching you happy. I don't care. I'm trying to impart stuff that changes you. Because God is going to give you stuff that you don't need to worry about anything. So I need to help you get the stuff and know what to do with it when you get it. And the key thing you must understand is to stand. Whatever God told you to do, it's going to come to pass. Stand. If everyone tells you it can't be done. Do you know how many people I went to Deloitte's, which is one of the biggest accountancy firms in the world. In fact, I hired one of the the head of Africa. uh, I could mention her name, but she came to work for my organization as our CFO, uh, a a chief financial officer. I brought her onto the board. um, But we went to see Deloitte's 2014 and uh, 2015. And uh, basically, I explained to them what I want to do with Africa. I told them about the economic model. I told them how we can um, monetize minerals in the ground, how we can issue digital currency asset backed by those minerals. I told them that we can set up a a special purpose vehicle and a government-owned enterprise, give shares to all of the citizenry, and then we can do a state flotation. All of that will mean the minerals, we convert it into cash. The cash will go to people's electronic wallets, and everyone will have $10,000 each. Every one of them said, impossible. It's never been done before. What are you talking about? Never been done before. But I knew my God told me what to do. And so I stood upon the truth of what he said. And having done all to stand, I continue to stand, having my loins girt about the truth. Are you hearing me? I know there's a bit of detail, but I want you to know, whatever God tells you to do and what he said can be done, I don't care if there's no frame of reference, you step out and do it. Noah had no frame of reference. Are you hearing me? Build the ark anyway. Stand on what he told you to do. Because God will make world scenarios and situations fit your narrative. Oh, you don't understand what I'm saying. Oh, but, but I don't see where. No, no, I don't know. Build it anyway. Because you don't know what's coming. Can you imagine the guy that may have got the vision? Do you know what? I think I might just uh, have a, a gloves company for PP. Uh, protection stuff, just gloves. I, fa- I fancy building some gloves. And I don't know why, but let's put some gloves together. And then the pandemic comes, and they've made multiple millions because everyone has to wear gloves or masks. World events can play into the vision you already had pre those world events happening. I don't know if I'm helping somebody. So if God knows what's coming, which he does, he's omniscient, develop what he's told you to develop. Even if it's disruptive. Spotify now, how many people will remember the days of the old caskets, the little cassettes that you'd put in your, your Walkmans, if you're old enough, I don't know if you remember. I found one in my mother's bedroom the other day, I said, oh, what's this, this is weird. But 20 years ago, no one would have thought Spotify would have taken over the music industry. 20 years ago, no one would have thought Airbnb with no properties would be bigger than the biggest hotel chains in the world. Are you hearing me? No one would have saw Bitcoin coming along and dashing Ethereum and all these other digital currencies taking over the, the banking industry, industry or the, the issuance of currency. No one would have seen that. So I'm asking you, because God knows what's coming, do what he's told you to do. And God will orchestrate the world events to fit your narrative. Stand, and having done all to stand, stand with your loins get about with the truth that God gave you. Is this helping anybody? Let me move on. So the truth God told me to tell you about this, other than being strong, is to be strong, you have to first know the Lord. You have to know your God and to do exploits. Exploits are deeds of great courage. These are feats that have not been done before. These are activities that require great strength and insight. This is what uh, exploits means. Are you with me? Business endeavors, business ideas. Are you still here? But to know the Lord, many people are saved but don't really know God. They know the God that they have been told about, but they really don't know God themselves. 
And God told me to share this vision with you. I hope you can handle it. It's a mystery, but I'm going to share it. Now, I'm not a denominationalist, please. I said humbly, don't insult my intelligence in the context of perpetuating doctrine. I wouldn't do that. Doctrine is designed, yes, and all scripture is given of the inspiration of God, but most of it's used to put other people down and to elevate your beliefs. Your theological beliefs become superior to other people's interpretation. That's not what it should be about. It should be about truth. But God said in this season right now, because of the extent and the gargantuan things he's about to do in the kingdom, how he's about to move mightily in all spheres of society, how we're basically having a takeover of the world. Are you hearing me or are you tired? Say, I'm about to take over. I'm about to own stuff on behalf of the kingdom. I'm about to advance God's will in the earth. So the thing God told me to say is in uh, 1 Timothy 3. Turn there, please, verse 16. I won't be much longer on this part. Are you still here? I know you're all tired and I'm conscious, but I have to say what God says say. Is that all right? Timothy, 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. Remember, I'm not a denominationalist. In fact, I'm a dominionist. Hello? How many dominionists here? Are you hearing me? 1 Timothy 3.16 says, and, we, and without controversy, great is the mystery, everyone say mystery, mystery, of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seed of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. This is a great mystery that the church has misunderstood. It is a mystery that has caused division and confusion. It is a mystery that has caused people to not unify in the things of God to advance God's will in the earth. And a king that is divided against itself, we know, cannot stand. So why have we not seen the kingdom of God advanced in the earth? Is because the people who are the kings and the priests after the order of Melchizedek, have not unified. The devil has sown doctrinal beliefs to such an extent that it prohibits us from unifying and working together. God says that there are the sheep that I have that are not yet of this fold, but they shall be one fold and one shepherd. God is about to allow the kingdom of God to resonate with people in all faiths and denominations, that they will gravitate towards each other, bring their light together, and advance God's will in the earth together. Are you hearing me? So this scripture is important because the Bible says in Daniel 11.32, they that know their God, is, knowing God is a prerequisite of doing exploits. Did you understand what I just said? Knowing God is a precondition or doing exploits is predicated on how much you know of God. But to know God, there's a great mystery because the Bible says great is the mystery of godliness. There's a mystery that needs to be deciphered. It says that God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto Gentiles, believed up in the world, and received up in glory. Now indulge me for a second, I am not going to insult anyone's doctrine. But I am going to speak on behalf of Yeshua today and give you truth from heaven. Because God needs his ambassadors to truly know who he is. I said the announcement was, Jesus is king, period. And so God needs his people to know that he is God. Can I deal with this for you? The issue has been, God has always been one.
But thanks to Constantine in 325 AD, he changed our thinking. He introduced the notion because Constantine was a sun worshipper. Did you know that? As a sun worshipper, he moved worship of God to a sun day. Flow with me. It was always Sabbath worship. But emperors thought they were gods. Twelve emperors, Julius Caesar, Herod, all of those guys, when they died, they deified them like if they were God. In fact, they called themselves the son of God. Because they needed the recognition and deification that they are God. But tell your neighbor, hear O Israel, the Lord thy God is one and there is only one God. You need to hear that there is one God because many of us don't really know which God we serve. Are we praying to the Father? Are we engaging with the Son? Or are we speaking to the Holy Spirit? When we pray, who are we talking to? Is it the Father? Is it the Son? Or is it the Holy Spirit? God says, they that know the Lord and know their God shall be strong and do exploits. This is not a doctrinal issue. This is not a heaven or hell issue. This is not a denominational issue. It is an authority issue. The reason I can walk into president's offices with no security, the reason I can go from country to country and never had anyone struggle to try and take me out, despite all I'm doing is because I don't just walk in knowledge and my assignment, I walk in absolute kingdom authority. That no weapon, even though it might be formed, shall be able to prosper because I have on authority. And the authority I walk in is not mine. And God told me to tell you that this concept was woven into the scriptures to confuse the body because my God is not an author of confusion. Would you agree with that? Neither would he allow his kingdom to be divided against itself. And one of the biggest things that has caused a rift in the body of Christ is doctrinal interpretation. Is God one or is God three? I'm going to talk some hard stuff very quickly. This is the mystery that God said to share. Can I show you some scriptures? It's going to make it plain. Because you need to get this right. Because when you come up against the spiritual wicked in its high places, you need to have no cognitive dissonance. By the way, God has no schizophrenia about him. He knows exactly who he is. Are you hearing me? Here, O Israel, Deuteronomy says, the Lord thy God is but one. The devil knows that he's one and trembles. That's what the scripture says. But when Constantine came along, and I'm a non-denominationalist, I do not belong to any denomination. But God said to me, Jonathan, you must understand who I am so you can walk in my absolute divine authority and not question when you come up against adversity. And how many people know, until you know who you are in God and who God is in you, you will not have the authority to do exploits. And God is tired of waiting on his people to develop the authority to carry out what he's already told you can be done. The devil is a lie. You're about to understand truth that is about to make everything plain. And you are going to walk wherever you want to walk with the power, the authority, and the knowledge of your God. Is anyone ready to receive this? Matthew 1, 21, let's go there very quickly. God said, I've got to teach this, and I, I'm not a denominationalist. I'm not one who's trying to accentuate any particular doctrinal persuasion. It has nothing to do with heaven or hell. It has everything to do with authority. Are you hearing me? How many people want to walk in authority? Matthew 1, 21. And how many people know God is not an author of confusion, is he? He's not going to renege or rescind on his word, is he? 
by two immutable things, it's impossible for your God to lie. Is that correct? He's not going to say one thing in one place and say something completely different in another. Dispensational truths and even the change of grace from law doesn't mean he changes. He said, I'm the Lord, I change not. I'm dealing with some religious spirits right now in the name of Jesus that needs to release your mind from doctrinal thinking that has kept you bound and away from authority. Oh, I'm dealing with it right now in the name of Jesus. I'm going right back in the power of the Holy Ghost into that stuff that has been sown into you that you don't even know who your God is. Matthew 1.21 says... And she shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Verse 23 says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted as God with us. Are you hearing me? Now, Please understand, go to Isaiah chapter 6, 9, sorry, Isaiah chapter 9. So the New Testament announcement of Jesus calls him Emmanuel, God with us. Is that right? Save his people from his sins. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Isaiah is a very keen prophet. He's looking down the ages. He's about to announce the coming of the Messiah and he defines who he is. Can I say something to you which is going to sound very controversial? Please follow me, flow with me and I'll make sense in a moment. I'm a believer in truth and truth sets you free. Technically, God is a God of detail and and specificities. God doesn't leave anything out that's nebulous. That has to be, there are mysteries and levels, which I'll talk about in a minute. But most, he likes to be plain and clear. He doesn't want you to be confused. And so in Matthew, we've just read, she, it says that the woman was with child of the Holy Ghost. Legally and technically, if the Holy Ghost was separate to God and Jesus, Jesus would have been the child of the Holy Ghost not the son of God. Come on, flow with me for a moment. If the Holy Ghost impregnated Mary, Jesus would be the son of the Holy Ghost. Hang on a minute. Pause. Let's go to Isaiah. King prophet, absolute clarity, announces his arrival. Isaiah says, unto us a child is born. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Unto us a son is given. I'm sensing the presence of God so strong. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His mandate for the kingdom. Which is what Jesus spoke about. He goes on to say, and his name shall be called wonderful. His name shall be Counselor, the mighty God, here it is, the everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. How can the Son be the everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace? There is one Father. If he is the Son of the Father, Isaiah calls him the everlasting Father. He says before that, he is the mighty God. I'm feeling the presence of God so strong. I need to represent my king. And the body of Christ needs to know that certain visions and understandings have been sown by other thinking. He is the mighty God. He is the everlasting Father. And he is the Prince of Peace. He's the principal one of Shalom. He is the King of Salem. Like Melchizedek, he is the King of Righteousness. And he's the King of Peace. Are you hearing me? So the Son of God, please understand, the word Son is Ben or Hryos. It just means flesh of God. 
So, because God gave jurisdictional authority to man in Genesis chapter 1, the only way he could change the, the systems and the authority is that he never breaks his own law. So divinity says, I can't go as God, divinity. I have to shroud divinity in humanity to have legal authority to operate with dominion in the earth because I gave dominion to man before he fell. So a man had to come to have authority to move about and to say, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. There's some religious spirits that have been holding your understanding of who your God is and that's why you've never been able to do exploits. But they that know their God shall do great exploits. Just to prove to you this understanding, John says in the beginning, John chapter 1, was the Word. And the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. John chapter 1. Goes on to say, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Nothing was created without him. Let's read, let me, we need to know this. Because kingdom folk have to operate in the power of the true and living God. I don't know if you understand me. Let me, let me get run through this. Are you still here? Let's go to John chapter 1. I sense something breaking. Constantine called the Council of Nicaea in 325. And the question or the topic of the agenda was who is Jesus Christ? And he amongst these sun worshippers defined our God and said he is three and brought out the notion of the Father, the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Can I tell you, if you go before Jesus, Greek mythology said there was an Osiris, an Horus, a Horus and an Isis. Three. One of them carried a child. Are you with me? So Greek thinking and Greek worship philosophy was infiltrating Constantine's world. And the reason he did that was to give the pagans stuff that they could relate to so they could flow with Christianity so there's further control. And in so doing, it watered down who our God was. Are you hearing me? John 1, let's read it. Verse 4 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Are you hearing me? Verse 3 says, All things were made by him, and without him was nothing made that was made. Are you hearing me? Verse 14 says, And the word was made flesh, and we dwelt, and dwelt among us. The word which was God was dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Are you hearing the word of God? So Jesus is the Word, Jesus is God in the flesh, Jesus is not the Son of God per se, He is the flesh of God, the human representative of a divine God, because eternity can't die. Oh, you need to understand, He knew why He came to the earth. One, to die for the sins of the world, but to bring you into his royal lineage. He died on the cross that you could cross over into his lineage. He died on a tree that you, can you understand, can move into his family tree. Are you getting this? So when he came, this is why when he was on the cross, you, you guys say, well, so people say, well, well, who was he speaking to when he was on the cross? Humanity took on all of the sins of the world. Divinity left him so humanity could die. Otherwise, he'd still be on the cross to this day. God is divine. He's eternal. He can't die. So when he left, he cried out, Iloi, Iloi, Lama Sebastiani, my God, my God, divinity, why have you left humanity? And when the sins of the world came upon him, the weight of sin because divinity left humanity, he gave up the ghost and died. Are you hearing me? So God wanted you to know, if you're going to be strong and do exploits, I can show you so many scriptures. In fact, let me just close you a couple of more on this section. Oh, wow. Can we turn to Isaiah again? Just to prove this point. 
Please, I'm not a denominationalist. I'm not a doctrinal uh, promoter. I'm a truth promoter. And the reason why the church hasn't got the power, the reason why the kingdom has not been advanced, the reason why the other denominations that were established by these secret societies have such power is because they have infiltrated the church with teachings that are not completely biblical. Secondly, they were the ones responsible for the interpretation of the King James Version. So they could define elements that fit their narrative. I don't know if you understand. I know this is hard meat. I know this is strong things to say, but I'm trying to help you. Think logically. Think with reason. Would God give revelation to people who then would call themselves gods? As in the Romans calling them all the atrocities that they committed. The people, they killed out all the Christians. Would Constantine be one that God would be giving this divine revelation to? Are you hearing me? So you have to understand truth in the word of God. I know I'm shaking some foundations, but God wants you to know truth. He wants to know who, you to know who he truly is. Let me just show you something in Old Testament that's going to blow your mind. Isaiah, go to Isaiah 46. Are you still here? Are you getting anything from this other than bored? I don't want to, I'm pushing something, but God said push. Isaiah 45. You would agree with me that God would never contradict himself. Would you agree? Are you still here? You'd agree that God would never renege on his own word. You'd agree? You'd agree that God would not sow confusion, yes? So what he says in the Old Testament, he's going to echo in the New. Is that right? Look at the scripture. So we saw Isaiah compared to Matthew. Look at this one. Isaiah 45. Verse 18 says, Thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God that formed the earth and made it. He established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. Oh. God is saying himself, I am the Lord and there is none else. I am God all by myself. Can we read on? Are you still here? Go down to verse 21. It says, Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. He hath declared this from ancient time. Who hath told it from the time? Told it from that time. Have I not the Lord? I and there is no God else beside me. A just God and a Savior. I thought Jesus was a Savior. God is saying he's the savior. Are you reading it in your Bible? There is none beside me. I am Elohim. I am the all-sufficient one. I am God in creation. I'm son in redemption. I'm Holy Ghost in regeneration. I am God. Let me read on. You might not believe this. Look unto me and be saved. I thought Jesus said that we need to look to Jesus to be saved. There's no name given amongst men the way by you can't be saved other than the name of Jesus. But God is saying, look unto me and be saved. He said, I am the Savior. Let me go down. Verse 23. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. And unto me, God is saying, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. Isn't that echoing Philippians 2.10? says, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow on things in heaven, under the, on the earth and under, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Can I present to you that Jesus was not just a man. He's not the third in the Trinity. He is God Almighty Elohim manifested in the flesh to save the world to shed his blood for the remissions of sins. So God himself robed himself in humanity, but his name was always Jesus. So the power is in the name. 
the light and the energy and the vibrations that all kingdoms have to bow to is in the name. So when you pray, you can only do, Colossians 1.17 says, do all that you do and all deeds in the name of Jesus. It doesn't just mean by declaring the name. It means that you have to be in the name. Any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. You've got to be in the name. In fact, you've got to be wrapped up in Jesus that when you start to speak, they, the realms don't hear you, they hear Jesus in you. I don't know if anyone's understand what I'm saying. So you have to understand. So this is an issue that has separated churches for years. I'm telling you without a doubt, I, I am non-denominational. I do not advance any doctrine that is denominational. I advance truth. And so what you must understand, the three really is one. His name is Jesus. Are you hearing me? And so God needs you to understand when you're praying, you pray to Jesus. Who is the Father? He is the Son. And He is the Holy Spirit. Proverbs 30 verse 6 says, if you don't know the name of the Father, look to the Son. And out of those three distinctions, the only name is Yeshua. Father is not a name. Son is not a name. Holy Ghost is not the name. So whatever you do, what of deed you do in the name has to be done in the name of Jesus. Jesus is your God. Is anyone hearing what I'm saying? The relevance of this is that you will not be able to have authority in the kingdom if you don't know who your God is. Is anyone hearing what I'm saying? I know this is deep truth, hard truth, cuts across so much that you've been told. Let me just throw something else out. If you look in the apostles, the Acts of the Apostles on the day of Pentecost, they all were baptized in the name of Jesus. Nowhere in scripture other than Matthew 28, 19, do you find that they baptize anyone in any other name than in the name of Jesus. This is not a denominational issue. Please don't relegate it to that level. This is a kingdom authority issue. It's not a salvation issue. It's not a heaven or hell issue. It is a authority issue. Because there's an authority in the name of Jesus that is in no other name. And so what Constantine and the churches of England decided to push was the notion of Father, Son and Holy Ghost. Everything they do in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. I'm not criticizing. I'm not judging. I'm not affecting or criticizing your doctrine. I'm simply telling you the truth. The power is in the name of Jesus. Are you getting this? So Matthew 28, 19, people don't understand. It says that you must baptize them in the name. Singular, one name. What is the name of the Father? What is the name of the Son? What is the name of the Holy Spirit? And you'll never find in Scripture any baptism done in any other name than in the name of Jesus. Why? Because they knew the authority of the name. And then apostolics and other church denominations made a doctrine out of it to make them look elitist and separatist. It's not about that. It's about authority in the name of Jesus. And if you're going to, do, you are called to do exploits. You are called to change times and seasons. You are called to king, bring kingdoms down. You are called to cancel kings. This can only happen through the authority of the name of the God that's in you. I know this is not what you wanted to hear in terms of preaching you happy. I didn't come to preach you happy. I came to set you at liberty for those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the vengeance of our God. Are you hearing me today? Stand to your feet for a moment. I want you to declare the name of Jesus. He is your God. And we've got bent out of shape, you know, God is, whether it's H2O or water, it's the same thing, isn't it? Would you agree? Yes. H2O is water, is that right? Yes. Two particles of hydrogen, one particle of oxygen, H2O. Two of hydrogen, one of oxygen. Look at Jesus. God is a spirit. Holy Ghost is a spirit. 
Jesus is the breath of life. H2O. All three are water. Analogously, I'm just trying to help you scientifically. Don't get bent out of the shape. They're all the same thing. It's water. Are you hearing me? So God wants you to know who he is. He wants you to pray to him. He wants you to do everything in his name. He wants you to represent his kingdom coming because he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Are you hearing me? So I want you to lift your voices. I know you're tired and I appreciate that it's been a lot of information to soak up today with the great preaching before and the truth that I've just shared with you now. But I'm preparing you for what God has called you to do. I'm preparing you that when you go through the gates of hell to take back what they've stole, nothing can touch you because you've traveled in the name of Jesus. You have the power of the name of Jesus. You are in Jesus. Are you hearing me? And I'm not challenging your baptism or anything like that, but I'm just simply saying baptism is a, an authoritative thing when you have the name on. Your name opens up doors for you. Your family name determines how people treat you. Your royal name should be the first thing that they hear. If I say I was part of the Windsor family of the Queen of England, every door would open for me because of my family name. Your family name is Jesus. And when you walk in that name, not does every demon have to bow, every tongue has to confess, but every door has to open. If you're going to do exploits, you have to have the name. You have to know what God you serve. You've got to know that the God of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New Testament. You've got to understand the Holy Ghost is just God's active force and energy. Are you with me? It's all the same God. Not three distinct persons. So lift your hands up and just say, now I know. Now I understand truth. I'm going to know my God to such an extent that I'll be so unmovable, so abounding, and so strong that I will do exploits for the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Now clap your hands and give him praise. Now you know your God. Can be seated. Two more moments and I'll try and get out your way. God told me to explain that mystery not from a denominationalist perspective, not from a doctrinal perspective, but that this mystery will be settled. That you'll know your God and be strong and do exploits. Are you hearing me? The last thing I wanted to deal with um, was Genesis chapter 17. Would you grace me just for a couple of minutes just to bring out this last piece um, that will bless you? Um, I'll pray by the grace of God that he'll give me the ability to articulate this quickly because I don't want to keep you long. Um, have you been blessed so far? Yeah. Have you received anything so far? Yeah. So let me just deal with uh, what's new in 22. Uh, man of God, you didn't want there to be a little recess. Or anything. You want me to just go straight in, yes? Okay, great. Um, the man of God graced me with two sessions in one because um, he knows I'm a verbose talker. <laughs> Um, and I really need time with you. Now, I wanted to share so much about uh, kingdom strategies. Yes. Okay, awesome. Yes, exactly. That would be lovely to do that. Can you just hold your seats for a moment, sip on the water, um, uh, hug your neighbor if you can, and share some of that love energy towards the person, the agape love. Um, but we're just going to play the video of Shining Stone again so you understand this, what the kingdom looks like, what this blueprint looks like. And then I'm just going to deal with this last piece. I don't think I'll be more than 10 minutes. Um, please don't leave your seats. Just watch what they're about to play. Can you play Shine Stone? The man of God the apostle just ask for that to be played. And then I'll finish off this Alaf bet. What's new in 22. And I pray it will bless you and we can go home. Have you had a wonderful life-changing conference so far? Your life is never going to be the same again. And every demonic realm that's tried to hold you has now released you in Jesus' name. Doors are going to cascade and open for you like you wouldn't believe. In fact, you can just going to walk through whatever door God puts before you. You can knock, 
but it will already be open by the time you get there. I don't know if you know, the kingdom doors are a bit different to normal doors. Normal doors, when you get there, you have to knock or you have to open. When you go to airports, there are sensors that check out when you're in proximity. And when you line up in the right position, it senses you and opens the door for you. I want to declare that the kingdom of God, we're now in an environment where there are sensors over every door. And God said there are doors that he's going to open that no man can shut and there are doors that he shuts that no man can open but there are some senses over the doors and as you line up with truth as you line up in the will of God for yourself as you walk towards the destiny and you trust in your God as you get there the door is going to open for you somebody just give God praise that the doors are opening for you but we have to plow today we have to push today we have to really fight and for what God's doing today I know it's hard work I know it's a lot of information but nothing comes easy we're birthing we're birthing the greatest reformation the world has ever seen so please forgive me if you're not excited by some of the stuff I've shared today but that's not what's important what's important is that you birth what God has given you are you hearing me? How many people feel that you're birthing something right now? Genesis 17 verse 15 says, And God said unto Abraham, As for Sariah, thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sariah, but Sarah shall, be, shall her name be. And I will bless her and give thee a son also unto her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations kings of people shall be with her shall be of her are you here are you here father thank you for this last piece of what we need to deposit in the life of your people i pray for kingdom clarity of thought and mind i pray for eloquence of speech i pray for precision of presentation and a sync to sync summary of this word in jesus name let everyone say amen I believe never has there been a clarion call for truth seekers like now. How many people know we need truth more than we've ever needed it in the church of God and in the kingdom? I believe we needed to see the awakening of woke worshippers that now have a real God encounter as opposed to a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. How many people are tired of the gimmicks in church? How many people are tired of the pop psychology and men's messages of manipulation rather than representation of the eternal God manifesting in the churches when we gather? Are you still here? How many people want to see the return of the burden removing, yoke destroying, anointing where when we call upon the names of Jesus, uh, multiple miracles are delivered in our sight, the sick is made whole, things are broken how many people would like to see that returning to the house of jesus christ no i mean dunamis in demonstration that unequivocally you know that god is god and his power is uh, irrefutably so that people who don't know god will come into the environment and will be touched by the presence of god and cry out what must i do to be saved how many people want to see us return to that kind of dunamis power permeating the molecules of the air of the atmosphere so when people show up they are transformed just by being in proximity to God's presence how many people are tired of words that lack revelatory insight hello how many people want to see words and rhema that's God's present word for a present day generation hitting the house that when you receive that word, not only does it transform you and transport you, it gives you instructions that can be applied to change your life straight away. This is a day of, of light that is going to be illuminating your path and that when you apply the knowledge, there is going to be change. Whether pre, pre or post pandemic, I believe there is still a drought of deliverance. There's still a level of despair and disappointment. I believe there's inordinate levels of discouragement and even discombobulation in the body of Christ. This should not be because there is too much darkness. There's perceived apathy where people come to church, expect to be blessed, go home, but there's no change. 
no conviction. There's no desire to be used mightily of God. Bless me culture has overtaken blessing culture. Are you with me? How many people know that God is changing that in the kingdom of God? Those narratives are changing in the kingdom of God. I believe this is definitely tantamount to the darkness that Isaiah 60 talks about, where he says there'll be darkness over the people, gross darkness over the world or over the, uh, the land. But he said, arise and shine, for the light has come, for the glory of the Lord is now risen upon us. How many people know that God is looking to you to shine that light, that his docks and kabod be risen upon you, that your affluence and influence will go into all spheres of society and bring about tremendous change? Is that you? Please understand that light, as I've mentioned before, is the illumination of information that dissipates anything that is not of God. It, it, darkness dissipates when light shows up. And so I believe God has taken to us a place where we will be free of deception because of the light of Jesus Christ. We've been deceived far too long. We've been in darkness far too long. And now God is saying it's time for his light to shine. How many people are happy that we're going to be free from demonic control of other people's perceptions, from uh, erroneous theology, from pagan traditions that have infiltrated the church? We're now going to be free from all of those deceptive, are you with me, De deleterious, destructive de uh, mindsets of people that is going to be dealt with. How many people are happy that truth is about to prevail? Not only that, we're going to be free from erroneous delusions of grandeur and delusions of insignificance, timidity, and insecurity. Timidity has been causing people to play political games in the church of God. If you can't get your way, then you'll strategize and you'll apply insidious activities to try and get things done. But thanks be to God, there is now going to be no more timidity in the house of God because people are getting an awareness of who they are in God. And that awareness is going to grant a level of security and drive out all insecurities. Are you hearing me? I want to just repeat after me and say no more intimidation. No more, intimidation. No more hesitation. No more, hesitation. No, more no more deliberation. No more vacillation. It's time for my kingdom elevation. It's time for my kingdom promotion. Until there's kingdom infiltration, occupation, and domination. All the kingdom people shout, that's me. But that being said, and all those promises that are coming and the bountiful blessings of the Lord that are coming, that we shall be the head and not the tail, above only not beneath, the lend on to every nation and not the borrower, and the delusions and deluge, which are not quite the same thing, the delusions will dissipate and the deluge of the dunamis are going to fall on God's people. Exusia is going to be on the kingdom house of God's house and our fears of influence where we're going to occupy, God's light is going to shine. There is going to be mass revivals like you've never seen before. Nations are going to come to Christ like never before. Presidents are going to come to your brightness of your rising. People who would never, ever go to church will want to chase you down and come into the kingdom. People that would never, ever wanted to get baptized will see the glory of the Lord upon you and will cry out, what must I do to be saved? These things are happening right now. This new kingdom era of the rising of kings is causing an absolute change the world has never seen before. Are you hearing me? I'm going to plow this thing for a few more moments and I'm going to get out of your way. Saying all of those wonderful things and this is a Kairos moment. This is definitely an appointed time. This is definitely an opportunity for God's power to be seen in the earth. But for God to fully manifest, it's going to be predicated on two things. And that's what I want to deal with in the story of uh, the uh, Genesis chapter 17. Are you here? May I have some water, please, if possible? Are you here? So the point I want to deal with, if I skip through a number of things because of time, if I just get to the key thing I want to deal with. In Genesis chapter 17... Abraham was 99. Everyone knows the story. It's one less of the number of perfection. Perfection is not just the number of seven. In the old Hebrew, uh, 100 was indicative of a maturity. And so Abraham was the age of 99. And God promised to bless Abraham 
obviously, as we know, at the age of 99, with the promise of what God gave him, that he was going to be a father of many nations and kings were going to come from him. Are you here with me? Not only that, if we can go to it, actually, just to help me, uh, Genesis chapter 17, I believe, verse 10. Can we quickly go there? Thank you. I think it was 10. Yes, and this, uh, this is my covenant which, shall, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee every man child among you shall be circumcised and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be broke a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. The, con the, the contract for the fulfillment of Abraham's promise was contingent on this one clause, that his foreskin, the area of his productivity, the area of his pleasure, the area of his reproductive activity for procreation, had to come under circumcision, had to remove the excess flesh that wasn't required even though it was given to him to produce a generation. God told me to tell you, before I deal with the, the numbers of the Hebrew alphabet, the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, he said that what, what God is about to do in you, and please just pray for me because I want to push through some stuff that's holding me up right now. But God said to tell you that your ability to fulfill all that he's asked for you to do will be contingent on excess flesh being cut away. Please hear me. The areas of your productivity, because God's going to give you a Midas touch that whatever you touch is going to turn to gold. You're going to advance his kingdom. You're going to do awesome things. You're going to have power that you've never had before. But before you can excel and extend those activities on behalf of God, you must remove all excess skin of flesh. You must be circumcised. You must ensure your flesh will not show up when God is about to show up. Are you hearing me? So God is looking to you to understand that. But on to uh, Sarah. Um, if I can move on. Are you still here? In fact, do me a favor. Just stand up for a moment and give God praise. It will help me. Because I'm just pushing through some stuff spiritually. I want you just to give God praise. Come on, give God praise for a moment. Come on, give God praise for a moment. Come on, charge me up for a moment. I've given out much. I just need your help for a second. Because the devil doesn't mind you getting information as long as there's no transformation. And what I'm about to share with you is about to bring some transformation. Lift your voices up a little bit more and push with me. Come on, cover me for a moment because this is important to come out. This has been one of the biggest hindrances in the body of Christ. Raise the volume for a moment. And give you God praise. Thank you so much. Can be seated. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Touch your neighbor and say, we're going to crucify the flesh. It has no place in the kingdom of God. Likewise, Sar Sariah, her name was changed to Sarah. Called to be a mother of the nation of kings. Abraham was going to be a father of kings. But Sarah was called to be a mother of nations of kings. Oh, you missed the revelation. Abraham, everyone's focused on because he's a father of many nations and father of kings in those nations. One king over those nations. Sarah was anointed and prophesied that she will be a mother of kings of nations. Oh, you don't understand. The nations that she's going to be mother over is also going to produce entire nations of kings. You don't understand. In the kingdom of God, the woman of God, Rosanna, an apostle here, is going to produce a nation, a state full of kings for the kingdom of God. Not just presidents. I prophesy some of you are going to be presidents of nations. I know you find it hard to believe, but trust me, in the next 20 years, some of you sitting here, some of the young men I laid hands on yesterday, God is going to promote them, he's going to school them, and they're going to become future presidents of African nations. 
I promise you this is going to happen. But out of the woman of God, linked to the man of God, there are going to be kings birthed. Kings upon kings upon kings in the environment that God has set up for the kingdom to be advanced. So Sarah or Sariah was prophesied this would happen and God changed her name to Sarah. Are you here? The word Sariah means pretty. It means princess. It means ruler. It means chief. It means principal, as the man of God was talking, and it means leader. Sariah. That's what she was before God changed the name to Sarah. However, the deeper meaning of her name was contentious. This is fact, biblical fact, study. Her name means contentious, Sariah, not Sarah. Her name means quarrelsome and argumentative. And her name means sarcastically arrogant. You wonder why God needed to change her name. When God changed her name, her fate changed. Oh, you don't understand. Look your neighbor in your face and say, I know I'm blessed, but God's about to change my name. Let me prove to you in the chapter before, when she asked Abraham to go into his, her, his concubine, Hagar, when she finally, after 10 years of serving uh, both of them, decided to be impregnated by Abraham, brought forth the child, you see Sariah's other side. She was pretty, she was the principal, she was the leader, she had all these wonderful qualities, but then there was an argumentative, quarrelsome, sarcastic side. So much so, Haggai had to run away from her because she was arguing her, she was treating her so badly, she needed to get away from her. Is that in your Bible? And God told me to tell you that some of you are so gifted and so blessed and so called, but there's an argumentative, there's a contentious, there's a quarrelsome side in you, and there's a duality that comes out of you. You're nice in church, as the man of God said, but sometimes at home you curse the person out. If you don't get your way, you'll start arguing with people. You'll gaslight them, you'll stonewall them, you'll ignore them for days. Woman of God, if you're married and your husband upsets you, the Bible says don't let the sun go down on your wrath. It's not kingdom culture. And Sariah was one of these people called to be a mother of kings, but had a quarrelsome side, had a contentious side. You know, some people just like to get on your last nerve. Sometimes they wake up with a bad headache and a bad head, and no matter how nice you are to them, they just want to be horrible. Just have negative things to say, can't find anything good to say. Depressed to such an extent that everything's dark. Can I speak truth? If anyone suffers with the spirit of depression, I command today that from this day forward, you're not going to see the negativity of the spirit of depression. It's going to lift off you and God is going to allow you to see things differently. He's about to change your name. Now let me explain some context why the name needed to be changed. So remember there are 22 Hebrew letters in the alphabet. I didn't have time to explain all the different layers of meaning because of time. I didn't want to over uh, and saturate your mind with too much information. But there are 22 letters of the alphabet. Each letter in the alphabet in and of itself has a design quality in terms of a symbol. It has a resonance that it gives off particular light and energy. The meaning of the letter has a story behind it. And then there is the word that it's in that creates a particular meaning. So even each letter of the alphabet has its own deep levels of understanding, context, and information. Very, very profound. Let me give an example. The first letter in the Hebrew Bible it, uh, alphabet is Aleph. Aleph means God. It means Elohim. That's where you get the term al Alpha and Alphabet. Bet is the second letter, which actually means um, to reproduce or, or, or a, a, the second element of God. It means uh, Abba, which means teacher also. So when you put together the first two letters, you get God, who is the father, who is the teacher. But if you roll on to the 17th, for example, let me choose one. Uh, the 17th letter is Pi or Pai. Pai means mouth, mouth. And so what it's saying, there's power in the letter of the mouth. 
You have to be very careful how you use your mouth because whatever you say, negatively or positively, you know will come to pass. The Bible says, whatever you say, that shall you have. The re- you'll have. The reason I've highlighted pie or paille is because in this season, please be careful as kingdom people with authority, what is it you talk about? Careful what it is you verbalize and be very, very, very careful what it is you have an opinion on. Make sure that opinion is based on some substance. Many people like to actually have opinions on stuff, as I said the other day, that they know absolutely nothing about. I will give you a philosophy that helps me in life. Seek first to understand and then to be understood. Do not be hasty in this season to have a lot of opinion about stuff that you haven't researched and investigated and have contextual understanding about. I don't want any kingdom person who God is going to bless to be quick to judge other people. Because your word is going to carry such weight that masses will believe you, so you must make sure what you say is accurate, is truthful, especially if it's talking about other people. Don't be hasty to perpetuate noise about negativity about other people. If somebody comes to you with opinion, do what Saul did. Find out and ask questions, discern properly, and make sure you know the right decisions. Sorry, what um, uh, Solomon did. Are you with me? Don't make a decision based on insufficient information. But let me get back. That was uh, number 17. Number 22 is Tav. So Aleph Tav is Alpha and Omega. Tav means the end of things. Are you with me? Tav talks about uh, the end of the completion of the whole cycle of the letter of letters of the alphabet. And Tav is very, very interesting um, in many, many contexts, which I'll only deal with a couple of them. Can we get the symbol of Tav on the wall, please? And I'm just going to finish off here because I, I pray this is going to bless you. But Sarah's name, Sar- Sariah's name was changed to Sarah, which is rather profound. The reason why her name was changed, because the I meant something different than the H. Are you here? The I meant something different than the H. The I means something that accentuates and turns something from what it is into something that it's not. So, for example, in the Hebrew alphabet, the I means something that disqualifies something and it ceases to be what it should be. Let me explain. The word authentic, when you add the Hebrew letter I to it, becomes inauthentic. Legitimate becomes illegitimate. Secure becomes insecure. So the I of her name had the ability to change what should have been into something that it's not. I'm going to help somebody today. Are you still here? But the H that God changed it to was very strategic. The word H is Hashem. Hashem means whatever God wants it to be, it is. It means God itself. So Sariah went from being a princess, a chief, and a leader to being Sarah, which means my princess as God. Meaning my queen as God. Are you with me? The reason that's important, I mentioned earlier, Tira named her to make him look good. So when God named her, it shifted the focus from Tira's recognition to God's exclusive kingdom recognition. Is this making sense? So it went from I to my. What I'm trying to say to you is that God is going to bless you beyond measure, but he needs you to move the I, me, myself, and I. He needs the self-elevation, the self-proclamation, the self-recognition to be moved out the way. He needs it to be recognized that it's not you, but the Christ that liveth in you. And the glory that he's going to put on you is actually not for your glory, it's for his glory. 
So to the Abrahams, he's saying, cut the flesh away. And to the Sarahs or the Sarahs, who God is going to bless with multiple kings under your custodianship, you must understand that everything you do must be for his glory and has to be owned exclusively by the kingdom of God and not about how you look or how you make anybody else look. And God said what's new in 1022 is that the people that he's about to raise up now are not going to be people who are worried about how great their name can be in likes, but they're only focused on his name being glorified and being the name that is above every other name. That's what's held back the kingdom of God from being advanced because every Caesar wanted to be a God. Every apostle wanted to know who was the greatest amongst them. Every individual wanted their name in the hall of fame, but having obtained a good report none of them entered the promise but you the new worked out processed prepared individuals that who are going to be kings in the nation God said this group of people are going to rise and only he is going to get the glory and have a guess what happens when you lift him up and him alone all these people what does the Bible say when I be lifted up I will draw all men onto myself God is not just going to draw men he's going to draw the resources of those men he's going to draw the intelligence of those men he's going to draw the what those men own into your life when you lift him up he's going to draw their houses that you didn't build their businesses they're going to be led to say do you know what I just had a dream last night and God said I should retire but maybe I should give the business to you because I trust the light of God that's on you and I can trust that you are going to lead some Josephs are going to be promoted into places of prime ministers over nations and given the vision like God has given me to preserve a posterity and say Save much people alive but it is a contingent it is predicated it has everything to do with that you must decrease and only one God can increase and his name is Jesus are you hearing me today so God is saying he's going to go from I to mine meaning owned by the kingdom and not about you are you hearing me the last thing I want to deal with is the last letter Tav uh, because of time I've cut so much out which has kind of uh, thrown me a little bit, but I'm going to quickly say the last bit because I want to just share the information and I pray that you will digest it and go back and, and play the message. Are you hearing something today that's helping you? One of the biggest things that's got in the way of God doing what he wants to do is us. As I mentioned in the very first sermon, and I'm about to wrap up when I deal with this symbol. In the very first sermon, I said to you, there are challenges because of the egos of men. We steal God's brand, we take his name. We plagiarize his vision and, and brand, but we make it about us. The size of our church, the how many souls get saved, how many TV stations we're on, it's really about us. How much word we know is actually about us sometimes, how we can impress people. Not that we really want to advance the kingdom of God. I'm not talking about me or this house, but some men of God are like that. Some people go to church for the very wrong reasons. They can't get a job. I'm talking about leaders now. So some people just go to run a church because it's an easy way to, they think of getting income. And I'm speaking hard truth, but I'm speaking truth that's going to set you free. Please know the spirit of the house you're in. This is a great house. This is a house that's going to redistribute wealth. This is a house that's going to build you and your legacy. But there's some houses and people online that are hearing this, you need to contemplate what is the reason for that house? Is it to create a demigod of the leader? Or is it to elevate the God of the leader? And so God only now is going to release so much to those who know it's not about them. It's all about him. Are you hearing me? The last one I want to deal with, and thank you so much for your patience with me uh, and bearing with me, and I hope I'm being coherent, but this last tav um, is really interesting. And it's interesting in the regard of what it means. So the 22 letters are actually a sequential order of tests that one would go through, and when you get to the last letter, it is a sign that you're about to be complete. So the number 22 or the letter 22, which is Tav, literally means now you're at the end of the process of being completed, being perfected, and being ready for the next level. 
I came to tell you as I wrap up with the tired self that I have, that you have come through the process, you've been prepared, you've sequentially gone through the order of God, you've paid the price, you've passed the test, and God is saying now, he's about to complete the process, and you're about to move to the next level. That's what's new in 22. What's new in 22 is going to be you. You are going to be the new you in 22 because God is going to do a new thing in you. There is no end. By the way, with the Hebrew alphabet, when you get to the last letter, that's why he's the Aleph Tov. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the ending because there is no ending in God. The word ending just literally means reset to go back to the beginning. So there is a constant continuum and a cycle of these processes. But each time you get to the end, you actually move to the next level. I want to announce to you that you've got to the end and you are definitely now moving to the next level. And he's qualified you through all of the things you've been through, all the 22 stages of your life. And you've now got to this point and you're now ready for the next point. Tav means God, truth, but it also means Truth will only be revealed in the end. Stop getting twisted in the middle of the process. Truth of why you went through what you went through will only be revealed when you get to the end. That's why Paul says, now I know all things are working together for my good. Are you getting this? You won't know until you get to the end. So please don't give up in the middle. Keep pressing towards the mark. Are you hearing me? Keep pushing till you get to the end. In the end, it will speak for itself. Are you hearing me? If people want to judge you, just say, hang on a minute. You can say what you want to say. I'm not going to retort. There'll be no rebuttal for me. Just wait until God's finished with me. And some of your enemies are going to absolutely struggle where God's going to place you when they see did this person who I said this about, who I tried to curse, who I set so much up against, who I rejected, who I slapped, who I told other people lies about. This person in the end ends up up here. I promise you that God is going to allow this to happen to you. But the last piece is this piece because you've been so good to me and I want to just finish uh, what God has called me to do. So Tav, in the end, the letter has four different meanings. It has an up, has an across, has a down, and it has the little quiff at the corner at the bottom there. Tav is also speaks of the tribe of Dan, which was the last tribe of Dan. So the last tribe of the children of Israel. Israel, by the way, means Israel. Isra means fight. El means God. So the Israel, house of Israel were those who fought for God. Are you with me? And so this is indicative of those who will fight for God's will in the earth. The first thing you need to understand, by the way, the tribe of Dan, their role as the last tribe, when the tribes were moving out of the camps, Dan would go last. And what the tribe of Dan would do, they would watch for the things that the tribes, the first tribe or the other tribes left behind. And they would pick up from the camps and the tents the things that they left behind. I came to tell some people, some of the patriarchs that went ahead of you, they left some stuff behind. But God is going to call us kingdom, this last tribe of Dan, to pick up some stuff and hand it back to those that should have done stuff. Are you hearing me? And we are going to be the ones that implement things on God's behalf. Are you hearing me? But let me finish off with this. There's so much in, just in the letter of Tav. Tav also means the feet, uh, which means humility. And so we mustn't um, have any judgment or any issues against the feet, if it, even if it's not the head. Because the head moves places because of the feet. Did you hear what I said? So, so please understand, even if you're last... That's why the Bible says the first shall be last and the last shall be first. You as the last and the most insignificant and the one that everyone overlooks with your humility. Your feet carries the head. I don't know if you're understanding me. Where the he feet go, guess what? The head goes. So for the head to move into completion and perfection, it needs the humble folk to take it there. Humility is not the absence of... Um, of, of, uh, of confidence and it's not necessarily a sign that you're meek 
It's just being real and true to who you are. That's absolute humility. But the last point here. So to finish off, to ensure you're ready for all that God has for you, Tav speaks of the first letter up there, the line, that speaks of being mature and ready and an observer of the laws of God. The letters are very profound. They have multiple meanings. So in order for you to be used of God in the kingdom of God, you have to be mature in the things of maintaining the law of God. Meaning that you don't struggle with keeping his commandments. You don't struggle with being a righteous individual. God is looking for people with clean hands and a pure heart who've not lifted their soul up onto vanity nor sworn deceitfully. The Bible says that he shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Kingdom folk are people who absolutely are keepers of the law and I don't mean the Torah. The one across the top is that you've mastered worship and prayer. This is the end. This is when everything's going to come to fruition. The top one means when you're almost ready and complete and mature and perfect in God's eyes, not only have you mastered the law, you've mastered what worship and prayer means. You have discipline in prayer. You have discipline in, in worship. You worship God because of who he is. You pray because you want to commune with God. You don't come before him with just babblings and words. You come before him because you want to know him. May I ask the question, if you're ready for God's kingdom to be established for you, have you mastered the law and have you mastered the worship and the prayer? The one down here means you've now been a person that has mastered kindness and generosity. Kindness and generosity. So before God can use you, before you're mature, before you're at the end of this completed process, you've also got to be a person who's naturally benevolent naturally kind you can't walk on the street and see somebody begging and it not move you you can't drive by in your nice car and see someone living on the side of the street and it not move you to want to give them something you've got to be one that finds a way to meet the needs of the people this is a pre-qualification of kingdom elevation God's not going to place all of his riches in your hand without knowing you have a hand that will release the riches he places in it. Are you hearing me? But this is the last little bit here. This last little bit speaks of humility. What that means is the ability to handle adversity just before he elevates you. You please got to understand this means that you will go through tremendous losses. It means that you will go through tremendous challenges. It means that you will lose everything that you held dear, including your reputation and your name. I came to encourage somebody, if you've mastered the law, if you've mastered worship and prayer, and if you've mastered being a generous person, trust me, just before elevation is the period of humility. If you're not sure, ask Job. The reason why Job was tested is because before he already had everything, God just had to prove to the devil he could handle losing everything and not cursing God. Are you hearing me? I came to encourage you. Many are thinking, why am I losing this? Why has this house been repossessed? Why has my car gone defunct? Why has my name been rubbed through the mud? Why have I lost the finance and savings that I had? Why did the business fail? It is part of God's process. In fact, it's indicative of a level of humility. God is not trying to humble you to make you feel small. He's trying to prove to you that he can take everything from you and you are still still going to be the same person you're still going to love him in the same way because once you've passed this little period and that's where we are right now I lost 9 million of cash I lost 40 million of, of investment money I lost everything that was, I held dear but God told me to tell you that it is just a sign that he's put you through the last little flip the last little bit of this design just before he completes doing what he's going to do with you he has to humble you he has to show that you can handle the losses and still be a person of integrity I came to tell you that God now is ready to complete you this period of this little bit of test is coming to a close in fact by the end of 22 it will be a completed period of your preparation for God's promotion and everything that you've ever wanted everything God wants to do with you will start to flourish and will start to be elevated in Jesus name for those of you who've received it 
Give God praise in the house right now. Stand to your feet. Come on, stand to your feet. Don't let the devil tell you God has walked away from you. Don't let the devil tell you that you did something wrong. Don't let the devil tell you that your generational curses are coming back. Just endure it as a brave soldier. And after he's tried you, you're going to come forth as pure gold. Rare minerals are produced under excessive pressure. Excessive pressure. Pressure that you can't comprehend comes on a diamond to make it what it is. And so I want to encourage you, as the man of God talked about stones, we are lively stones building up a spiritual house. We are lively stones building up God's kingdom house. And so I want you to be encouraged that the pressure is just producing the best quality stone in you. Are you hearing me? You are a diamond in the kingdom. A diamond is known by four C's. Clarity, carrot weight, color. Are you with me? Uh, clarity, carrot weight, color, and there's one other. Clarity. Cut, thank you so much. You said that. I love you. Thank you so much. Cut. And so please understand, things will have to cut you, but the things that cut you will increase your value. Clarity. This conference has brought clarity. It has brought weight. It's given you color and multidimensionalism. And now the cutting is over and God is about to use you as a tremendous light that will be channeled through this diamond to illuminate the rest of the world. So I want you to give God praise. Thank you for bearing with me. Man, I'm tired. <laughs> but I've deposited some stuff that hopefully helped you. I want to come back. There's so many things I wanted to say and over time and I realized over the days as it unpacked that I, I just couldn't truncate it all to, get, to take you on a journey that you'd understand. So I had to sort of cherry pick certain things which as a clear thinker I like to be coherent and cohesive so it was a little bit discombobulating for me but I hope that you got some nuggets of truth. I hope your life has been changed and enriched. I pray that you have a different mindset and perspective and outlook that you'll be confident that God is going to bless you, finance everything you need done. He's going to use you mightily to change nations and his finest hour will come through you. And I want you to be happy that your existence has purpose. The spirit of suicide, I bind it in the name of Jesus. You, your life has purpose. And so forgive me, don't look at the man who's tired and can hardly put two sentences together. I will work until I drop <laughs> to make sure there's some change. And I really pray. In fact, I know you are going to excel and do great things for the kingdom of God. And I wanted to do a business uh, conference as well. So I, I said to uh, Apostle, I'm happy to come back because there's so much detail in Proverbs 31. So much detail in Luke 19, 13 and clear strategies and stuff. I believe you've got the capacity after this conference to receive it, to understand it. And so I'd like to come back and take you through a specific entrepreneurship kingdom uh, business where there's real strategies, real businesses, ideas, and we can talk about funding and investments, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and how to create businesses that will absolutely excel. How many people would like to be a part of that conference? And I promise you, I won't do so many sessions that I'll be so dead like I am now um, that you'll get the best of me and it will help the future of your life and your legacy that will follow you. So I love you. I thank you for having me. I thank you for your patience with me and I pray that you'll continue to pray for me. And I will see you on the other side of greatness where we make our great God look wonderful. And like the, the Proverbs said, one woman, your God shall be known in the city gates. God bless you, love you.